Jong Hai Yuan, a teacher at the Jong Feng Shen Primary School in Ganzhou City, was being detained because she supported so-called counter-revolutionist Li Julian. During the detention, she refused to admit any guilt. Moreover, she wrote on the prison wall down with Hua Gofeng, the then Chinese Communist Party leader. As a result, Zhong Hai Yuan was also classed as counter-revolutionary and sentenced to death. On April 30, 1978, she was tied up, paraded on the street, and then taken to the execution site to be executed. The soldiers who carried out the execution deliberately fired the bullet at the right side of her back instead of the left side where the heart lies, so that she would not die instantly. Waiting medical personnel rushed forward and brought her into a covered military vehicle. On the surgery table temporarily set up for the purpose, they quickly took her kidneys while she was still alive. One of the kidneys was soon transplanted into the body of a senior official's son in Nunchung No. 92 Field Hospital. Over 30 years have passed since then. With the reform and open-door policy, China's economy has grown rapidly. At the same time, induced by huge profits, the number of organ transplants has also increased astonishingly. Especially since 1999, there has been an explosive increase in the number of organ transplants in China. According to official figures, the annual number of organ transplants reached nearly 20,000 in 2006, ranking it number two in the world. Moreover, people who could receive organ transplants have expanded from the privileged senior officials of the Chinese Communist regime to rich people who could afford the high price. Before 2007, as long as one could afford a few hundred thousand Chinese yuan, many large hospitals in China could offer the shortest waiting time for organs. In the six or seven years since year 2000, the waiting time publicly declared by some hospitals was one to four weeks, or even several days. Many large hospitals carried out multiple transplant surgery at the same time, day and night without stop. Behind these astonishing figures hides a serious question. In China, where are these massive number of human organs coming from? In the 21st century today, does the tragedy suffered by Zhong Haiyuan, whose organs were harvested while alive, still go on? The United States is the largest organ transplant nation in the world. It has a well-established national database of organ donors and recipients. It also has a highly effective shared network for nationwide organ transplants. About 80 million people voluntarily agree to donate their organs after their death. At the same time, the number of organ donations from relatives is also very large. Even with a system like this, the average waiting time for organ transplants in the U.S. is still quite long. The heart, about 8 months. The liver, 26 months. And the kidney, 37 months. Why is this? Because the organs used for transplants must be from healthy people. Moreover, the organ's ischemia time during the transplant must be very short. The kidney requires less than 12 to 24 hours. The liver is 12 hours, while the heart is 4 to 6 hours. Therefore, unless they are donated from living relatives, the organs used for transplant can only be from healthy voluntary donors who have just died. Not only that, patients can only accept organs matching their blood types and tissue types. Take kidney transplantation as an example. According to National Kidney Foundation of the United States, the chance of getting a perfect match kidney from a non-relative donor is only 6.5%. Obviously, the probability of getting a suitable healthy organ is quite small. In China, due to cultural reasons as well as a lack of related legal safeguards, the number of voluntary organ donors is pitifully small. Up to September 2007, China had only 61 organ donors in total from brain death. Organ donation from relatives only accounts for 1.1% of total organ transplants there. Although legal and legitimate organ sources are very rare, large hospitals in China never seem to worry about sources of organs. The Oriental Organ Transplant Center used to claim on its website the average waiting time for a suitable liver is two weeks. On the application form for an organ transplant at the Organ Transplant Department of Shanghai Changjung Hospital of the Second Military Medical University, it once clearly wrote, the average waiting time for a liver transplant is one week among all patients. Established in 2003 and closed in September 2007, 
The China International Transplantation Network Assistance Center was an organ agency for foreigners. It was situated at the Organ Transplant Research Center of the first affiliated hospital of China Medical University in Shenyang, Liaoning Province. Through this agency, as for the kidney transplantation, it may take one week to find a suitable donor, the maximum time being one month. It further goes on to say, if the doctor discovers that there is something wrong with the donor's organ, the patient will have the option to be offered another organ donor and have the operation again in one week. China's Sanlian Life Weekly reported on April 7, 2006, about 98% of organ sources in our country are controlled by authorities other than the Ministry of Health. What are those authorities other than the Ministry of Health? The article did not specify. Before its closure, the Chinese International Transplantation Network Assistance Center disclosed even more astonishing information. The website's question and answer section contained the following set of questions and answers. Question. Even if the organ transplant operation is successful, is the survival time after the surgery only two or three years? Answer. Indeed, we often hear this kind of query. But this refers to the kidney transplant cases in Japan where organs were taken from brain death corpses. In China, kidneys are taken from live bodies. This is completely different from what Japanese hospitals do. Question. Is it possible to be infected with other diseases such as HIV or hepatitis after the kidney transplantation? Answer. It is not necessary to worry about that. The biggest problem with a kidney transplantation is the tissue match. Before the living kidney transplantation, we will examine the donor's renal function and leukocyte in order to assure the safety of the kidney. So it is more safe and reliable here than in other countries, where the organ is not from a living donor. The question answer section disclosed a clear and explicit message. The organs are not from corpses or brain death victims. Instead, they are from living people. In fact, the China International Transplantation Network Assistance Center is not the only living organ provider in China. Here is a phone conversation between an investigator posing as a patient's relative and a doctor in the First People's Hospital of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The precondition to ensure the supply of such large number of human organs for such short waiting times is the existence of a large organ bank of live donors. Furthermore, this group of people must be under strict control so that their physical conditions could be examined any time. Whenever a transplant patient arrived, a matching donor would be found from the bank. His or her organs would be taken out for the transplantation in order to ensure the organ's freshness and vitality. So what kind of people form this live organ bank? The international community commonly believe the allegation that the Chinese communist regime takes organs from the executed prisoners for transplants. However, this single source of organ supply cannot account for the explosive increase in the number of organ transplants in China during the past decade. Although the exact number of the executed prisoners in China is a so-called state secret, the state-run China News proclaimed in its report on September 6, 2007. For more than a decade, the people's courts have been very careful with and taken strict control in giving out death penalties. The number of executions have been decreasing steadily. Meanwhile, according to reports by official Chinese media, the total number of organ transplants in China during the six years after 2000 was more than three times that of the six years prior to 2000. If those 98% of organs for transplants in China that came from non-medical system were all from the executed prisoners, how could one explain the sharp increase of organ transplants in the past decade while the death penalties had been decreasing steadily? Was it due to the improvement in transplant technology? Let's take a look at the kidney transplant. In 1998, the number of kidney transplants in China was 3,596. 
In 2004, it exceeded 10,000, three times that of 98. Between 98 and 2004, there had not been much improvement in kidney transplant technology. Obviously, technology improvement is not the reason behind the explosive increase in kidney transplants. Moreover, death penalties need to go through certain legal procedures, such as court hearings and appeals. Prisoners could not just be sentenced to death and their organs taken when transplant patients came. Then, what group of people could be subjected to organ harvesting and their lives taken so conveniently and speedily? Other than the prisoners on death row, who were these large group of people that were forced to live between life and death? For decades, the Chinese Communist regime have consistently denied allegations from the international community that it harvests organs from the executed prisoners. However, in 2005, at a World Health Organization conference in Manila, China's Deputy Health Minister Huang Jiafu publicly admitted for the first time that the majority of China's transplant organs were from the executed prisoners. But on April 10, 2004, Mao Trenan, the spokesperson for the Ministry of Health, again denied harvesting organs from the executed prisoners when answering questions from reporters. In November 2006, at a meeting in Guangzhou, Huang Jiafu acknowledged again that over 90% of transplant organs in China came from the executed prisoners. Subsequently, on January 11, 2007, Mao Chuenan changed his tune in his interview with the BBC and also claimed that most of China's transplant organs were from executed prisoners. Apparently, on the issue of whether to publicly admit the organ source being from the executed prisoners, there were initially different views inside the Chinese Communist regime. Then what had forced the regime to conform to a single view and publicly admit a scandal it had been denying for decades? Was it because of the awakening of their conscience, or was it being used to cover an even larger crime? On December 22, 2000, the overseas Falun Gong Minghui website suddenly published a piece of news from China alleging some evil police are plotting with greedy doctors to sell organs of Falun Gong practitioners. It is learned that just one clinic in the city of Shijiazhuang alone has been given six organs. Without disclosing further details and because the brutality in the information was beyond belief, this news didn't get much attention at the time. Five years later, on March 8, 2006, an anonymous former Chinese media reporter in Japan told the U.S. Epic Times that there existed a special place in Sujatun district in Shenyang, Liaoning province, where large numbers of Falun Gong practitioners were secretly detained. These practitioners would eventually be killed and their organs taken for transplants.在当时吧，呃，所得到的数据呢，应该是有六千人。但是，当时是在那个呃两年前左右吧，也就是两千零四年，嗯，左右的那个时间里边。那是在里面，可能是在被强迫转化、被打、被关押、在生命垂危的时
。我的前夫曾经参与过摘除法轮功学员器官的手术，他是一名脑外科医生。参与摘除法轮功学员眼角膜手术，包括包括部分在法轮功学员活体上摘除眼角膜。我的家人告诉我说。他说：“你不知道我有多么痛苦，因为这些法轮功学员是活的。若从死人身体上摘除器官，这还好说。可这些人都真的还是活的，这些事情都是秘密进行的。我们医院参与的医生很多是从其他医院调过来的实习医生。这些人的器官被摘除以后，有的人就直接被丢进焚尸炉中火化，没有留下任何痕迹。” After the second Su Jiatun witness came forward. Another ten days passed amid shock, anxiety, and speculations. Surprisingly, the Chinese Communist regime, that is usually very sensitive to the international media, kept quiet for three weeks on such sensational accusations. On March 28th, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Qin Gang denied the Su Jiatun incident at a regular press conference, calling the accusation deliberate fabrication and wicked slander. Chin also invited foreign media to visit Su Jiatun and conduct their own investigations. Perhaps as a response to the foreign ministry statement, two days later, a man who identified himself as a veteran military doctor in the Shenyang military region wrote to the Epoch Times to confirm the existence of the Su Jiatun concentration camp. He further alleged that Su Jiatun was just one of several dozen such concentration camps across China. A month later, this veteran military doctor wrote to the Epoch Times again, disclosing more detailed information on organ harvesting of living Falun Gong practitioners. He said during the detention, real names were used for Falun Gong practitioners and other detainees, but when it came to organ transplant, fake names were used. In other words, false identities were created, and the information about these fake people was quite complete. Moreover, these people would have signed voluntary organ donation forms. Of course, the signature was faked as well. I had encountered over 60,000 of these documents with falsified signatures. All of them said that the individual voluntarily agreed to donate some kind of organs for transplant and was willing to undertake all the consequences. There were even signed forms expressing their willingness to donate their hearts for transplants. Many signatures were the handwriting from the same person. The time limit for keeping these documents was 18 months. Then they must be destroyed. This veteran military doctor continued. Many people concentrated their attention on the official organ transplant figures. In reality, the number of organ transplants carried out underground was many times more than the official figures. The organ transplants are managed by the military, so attentions must be concentrated on many military facilities. Those are the true concentration camps. This explosive news exposed such brutality that many people may find it difficult to believe. However, looking at atrocities committed by the Chinese Communist regime in history, this is not impossible. The first kidney transplant surgery in Communist China was done in 1960. Since then, it has become a routine practice to take organs from living prisoners to meet the needs of senior officials from the party, the government, and the military. Like this Jiang Xi. Like Zhong Haiyuan in Jiangxi Province, her kidney was taken while still alive in order to carry out the kidney transplant for a military pilot. Zhong Haiyuan had her kidney taken as a political prisoner. In other words, in the system of the Chinese Communist regime, once someone is labeled as a political prisoner, an enemy of the party or the state, no method used against them is considered excessive. Then, when Falun Gong practitioners are being persecuted, they fall into the same scenario. The regime has used every means in its disposal to demonize Falun Gong and sees it as its biggest enemy. Therefore, in the society, everyone knows that the Chinese Communist regime has regarded Falun Gong as the enemy. On October 9, 1984, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Procuratorate, Ministry of Public Security, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Civil Affairs jointly issued a document titled "Temporary Provisions on Using Bodies and Organs of the Executed Prisoners." The document clearly stipulated that organs from three types of the executed prisoners could be used for transplants. The regulation provided legal backing for harvesting organs from the executed prisoners. More frightfully, it broke the moral bottom line of people involved, such as police and doctors. 
when body parts of certain people are legally defined as industrial raw material, the defense and respect for the human body becomes non-existence. When they went to appeal to the government, many Falun Gong practitioners destroyed their ID cards to avoid implicating others. When arrested, they would also not give their names or where they are from. Therefore, to the Chinese communist regime and those people who want to take organs from living people, these practitioners become the most suitable targets for organ harvesting, as their disappearances would not be discovered or reported. Without a doubt, organ transplantation is a highly lucrative business. The Organ Transplant Center of the People's Liberation Army No. 309 Hospital claimed on its website, Our transplant center makes most money for clinic department. From January to June of 2004, income was 13.57 million yuan. This year, 2004, it is likely to exceed 30 million yuan. According to an article in the Southern Weekend on July 18, 2007, the Oriental Organ Transplant Center in Tianjin made huge profits. Liver transplants alone brought the center at least 100 million yuan a year in income. In September 2006, the new building for the Oriental Organ Transplant Center, costing 130 million yuan to build, opened for business with 500 beds. The explosive increase in China's organ transplants started with the persecution of Falun Gong in 1999. The Su Jiatun incident and the inside information disclosed by a veteran military doctor from Shenyang made people realize for the first time that body parts from innocent Falun Gong practitioners might have become the raw material for this industry. After the Su Jiatun incident came to light, representatives from the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate in Shenyang were given two guided tours of the Thrombosis Treatment Medical Center in Su Jiatun, once accompanied by hospital officials, once by officials from China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. After the visits, they issued a statement declaring that they found no evidence that the site is being used for any function other than as a normal public hospital. Meanwhile, responding to the invitation issued by China's foreign ministry spokesman, Qin Gang, to the international media, the Coalition to Investigate the Persecution of the Falun Gong in China, a non-governmental organization formed by Falun Gong practitioners, third-party lawyers, scholars and journalists, applied for visas at China's overseas embassies and consulates, requesting to go to China to independently investigate the Su Jiatun incident. All the applications were uniformly refused. On the one hand were detailed inside stories. On the other hand were the denial by the Chinese Communist regime after a long silence and its refusal to the third-party independent investigation. The whole thing seemed to have reached an impasse. If the world turned a blind eye on such horrific and detailed allegations, it would be a disgrace to all of humanity. Even though the Chinese Communist regime set up many barriers to the independent investigation, people with a sense of justice did not give up. They expanded their focus from Su Jiatun to the whole of China and were determined to find out whether the regime really harvested organs from living Falun Gong practitioners. On May 8, 2006, at the request of the Coalition to Investigate the Persecution of the Falun Gong in China, former Canadian Secretary of State for the Asia-Pacific region David Kilgore and renowned international human rights lawyer David Matus formed an independent fact-finding team to investigate the allegations that the Chinese Communist regime had been harvesting organs from living Falun Gong practitioners. On June 2nd, the two investigators sent a letter to the Chinese embassy inquiring about the terms of their entry into China to carry out a truly meaningful independent investigation free from the Chinese government surveillance. On June 23rd, the Chinese embassy in Canada rejected Kilgore and Matus's visa applications. However, one person did succeed in entering China. He was Mr. Edward McMillan Scott, Vice President of the European Parliament. From the May 20th to the 24th, 2006, during his preparation for a human rights and democracy report for the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, Mr. McMillan Scott went to Beijing and met various officials, including European Union delegates, public figures, as well as two Falun Gong practitioners from Beijing, Niu Jinping and Cao Dong. Cao recounted to him what he witnessed in the jail. Cao Dong is in his 30s. He'd been a prisoner in northern China, um, and uh, he gave a very nervous, understandably, very nervous 
um, report mm -hmm. of what he had seen in that prison, I asked him whether he was aware of the practice of what is known as organ harvesting, mm -hmm. which is taking body parts from prisoners to order, in effect. This is a trade which is run by the People's Liberation Army for profit. And he said, he, he could only tell me that he had a friend, another Falun Gong practitioner, in the prison in northwest China. And um, the friend disappeared one day. And the next time he saw him was his body, the friend's body, in the prison hospital with holes where body parts had apparently been removed. And um, so after the uh, meeting I had with these former prisoners, they were all arrested. Cao Dong was later uh, convicted of meeting me, of just a vice president of the European Parliament. Just because of meeting just you. Just because he met me. And um, he was sentenced to five years in prison, and he remains in prison now. The investigation continued with more people joining in. Among them were Dr. Kirk Allison, associate director of the program in human rights and medicine at the University of Minnesota. Ethan Gutman, adjunct fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, and his assistant, Li Shai Lamish. They both formed independent investigation teams looking for witnesses around the world. They interviewed Falun Gong practitioners who had been imprisoned by the Chinese Communist regime and searched for recipients of organ transplants in China, the organ intermediary agents, and also doctors involved in the transplant surgeries. The first thing people wanted to know was the experience of Falun Gong practitioners who had been imprisoned by the Chinese Communist regime. What did they see? What did they hear? And what did they experience personally? Without exception, the practitioners they interviewed all talked about torture, brainwashing, the threats and also the repeated and especially careful health checks and blood tests. Falun Gong practitioner Gan Na, who now lives in Toronto, Canada, was one of the 34 Falun Gong witnesses in the investigative report by David Matus and David Kilgore. Gana was from Beijing and used to be a customs official at the Beijing airport. When she was detained for the third time in the Beijing Xinan female labor camp, she was subjected to blood testing, x-ray, ECG, and cornea examination, etc. Falun Gong practitioner Zhang Yijie, who used to work at the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Commerce, had been detained seven times. The last time was in June 2001. She was detained in the Beijing female labor camp. Falun Gong practitioner Zhou Yu Yuan was from Guangzhou. She was illegally detained in the Guangzhou Chateau female labor camp for 22 months from January 2000. After that, she was arrested again and forced to go through all five different brainwashing classes in Guangzhou. 转到最后一个洗脑班因为没有别的肯收的时候就转到就是因为我本身属天和区的嘛就天和区那个洗脑班把它拿回去了就是那个医生就带我专门带我到医院去检查检查很详细检查的很详细还有那个脑电图什么当
On the other hand, there were these strange health checks and blood tests. Many Falun Gong practitioners were puzzled with these self-contradictory behaviors. More strangely, the doctors who carried out these health checks were not interested in treating injuries. They were only interested in healthy people. Here, we're told, for example, in Masanjia, when the women were taken into Masanjia labor camp and they went into the hospital uh, clinic to check uh, their health, if somebody came in on a stretcher, that is, they were lying down from torture, they'd already been beaten in the d- detention center or in Masanjia, then the doctors would look at them and just wave them away. So if they were visibly injured or sick from torture, they would not be interested at all. They wanted young people, healthy people, and the more healthy they were, the more comprehensively they checked them. They did repeated blood tests and urine samples to see how they could use their organs. In June 2008, David Matus found a person in the U.S. who was once imprisoned in Jiangsu province. He was not a Falun Gong practitioner. To avoid persecution from the Chinese communist regime, he was given an alias, Lanny. During a two-year imprisonment between March 2005 and the beginning of 2007, Lani was transferred between 17 different cells. The prisoners who had been there for a long time told him that during 2002 to 2003, at least two to three Falun Gong practitioners in every cell had their organs removed while still alive. <laughs> Lanny had personally witnessed the scene of a person being injected with drugs before being taken away for organ harvest. Uh, in, in one case, he saw this person being um, inoculated or, or, or uh, being fed intravenously a syringe, which had a, a numbing effect on him. There on the were, neck? On the neck, yeah. Uh, the, uh, there was this white hospital van that was sitting outside all the time. And the cell leader would tell uh, the, this fellow Lani that these prisoners were actually being uh, organ harvested and, uh, and that van outside was for that purpose and, and the injection was for that purpose as well. In November 2006, Lani was transferred to another cell in the same prison. The cell also imprisoned a Falun Gong practitioner called Chen. The cell leader was basically the same routine he'd seen for the prisoner sentenced to death. That, uh, the, uh, that somebody had come and blood tested him, uh, that there was a syringe put in his neck, uh, that uh, the people in white uh, clothes had come to fetch him, that there was a hospital van outside.
，没什么呃这个隐瞒的事情。Witness Lani indicated that the purpose of police beating Falun Gong practitioners severely was sometimes for their organs. If a practitioner's blood and tissue type matched that of a patient who needed an organ transplant, then this practitioner became a target of severe beating. He is looking, that is, he sees that this patient is the person who needs the organ transplant. He beats that person. He is very strict. He is very strict. He is very strict. 呃，通知打啊，通知那个就迫使你让被警察闹闹翻的，这一种小闹翻，开场就打你，打你然后你打了你你不服气，你再再再闹再闹再打嘛，打了几次的话，你打伤，把你打到那个肋骨打断的，腿打断的。The statement by witness Yu Xin Hui in his interview with Ethan Gutman and his assistant Li Shai Lamish also confirmed what Lani described. For example, a man we interviewed in Bangkok, he escaped to Bangkok. His name is Yu Xin Hui. And he was jailed for six years at Sihui Prison in Guangzhou, in the south. He、um, said it was common knowledge among the prisoners that people were taken regularly whenever somebody needed an organ, when an official needed an organ, when some rich person needed an organ, that they were taken and removed from from the prison. And sometimes the other inmates or the guards would threaten him and say, "If you don't cooperate, we will kill you and we will sell your organs." Yes. <laughs> 我们在监狱都知道，只要你死，或者说你还没死或者怎么样，其实你都要把你的器官搞定。Yu Xin Hui had experienced three health checks in the prison. The last one was in March 2005 under the close watch of the armed police. People in the prison also knew that there truly existed a name list. Every year, people on the name list would be taken away and would never come back again. Once a year, a bus would come in, and it would sweep through their prison cells, and they would park right outside their building, and the policeman would come into their、uh, their hallway, and they'd have a list of people, and they'd go in and ask for the person, check, okay, you this person, okay, just take your shoes, take a jacket, let's go. They would not even allow them to get their stuff. Go to the next room and find a person. It was very terrifying for them. They didn't know who was being taken, why, where they were going, and they just collected these people, put them on a bus. Sometimes it was two or three or four big buses full of people in the middle of the night, take them away, and、uh, these people were never seen from, seen or heard from again. From the Google online satellite map, Yu Xin Hui pointed out to the investigators the parking locations in the jail for the coaches that were used to take away Falun Gong practitioners late at night. Among the witnesses interviewed by these two investigators, 15 of them were forced to go through these suspicious health checks and blood tests, like Yu Xin Hui. And I mean, basically, if you're Falun Gong and you're in prison, you're on your way to be an organ harvesting, as far as I can see. In order to obtain more direct evidence, overseas investigators made direct phone calls to a number of hospitals and transplant doctors to ask about the sources of organs. The callers presented themselves as potential overseas recipients or relatives of potential recipients. Hey, is the Song Chairman? Ah, you say. Hey, hey, I, he, that doctor told him that this patient is good. He said that the organs are good. We have. We also have. This, we may have. Probably. 今年到是目前为止，可能这样的有十几个这样的身上。啊，喂，哎，请问是广州军区武汉总医院？哎，那你们这边的话，有没有可能就是法轮功这样的肾源？有没有可能有几个？法轮功该用也用呗，是不是？你管他法不法轮功啊，是不是？哎，你好，你是中山医院？呃，对，是的，你好，是是是肝脏移植中心吗？嗯、呃，对，是的。哎，我想咨询一下我的。那你等会儿啊，我在医生那儿啊啊。In addition, the International Coalition to Investigate the Persecution of the Falun Gong in China, headquartered in the U.S., confirmed the same conclusion with a similar method.
One example is between June and July 2007, an investigator from this organization established the connection through phone calls with a kidney intermediate agent at the Army's number 307 hospital. The communication lasted for several weeks and the accumulated conversation's time amounted to several dozen minutes. At the same time, when the above testimonies were obtained, the Israeli police solved a case that provided more direct proof for the allegation of organ harvesting from living Falun Gong practitioners. On July 31, 2007, the Israeli police arrested four men suspected of being intermediary agents for introducing people to go to Asia to have organ transplants. They made several million dollars from patients without declaring it. The arrested suspects were the CEO of Medict, Yaron Ishak Yodikam, and his partners. The largest newspaper in Israel, Yediath Aranith, Latest News, reported that on November 17, 2006, unaware that their conversation was being recorded, Yodikin told a disguised reporter for the newspaper's weekend magazine that his company could help to provide organs from China's political prisoners, death row prisoners, and Falun Gong practitioners. After the publication of this report, the Israeli authorities started a long investigation of him and confirmed the content of the report. Faced with the investigation by the international community, the Chinese communist regime responded with its usual manner. The spokesman for the China's foreign ministry, Qin Gang, stated, On the one hand, the regime, without any proof, firmly denied the allegations. On the other hand, it quietly set up various obstacles to the independent investigations. In August 2006, in Melbourne, Australia, Parliament member Victor Purton invited David Kilgore to give a speech in a forum. As a result, the Chinese consulate sent a letter to all members of the parliament asking them not to attend this forum. In September 2006, in Helsinki, Finland, the Human Rights Committee of the Finnish parliament received a phone call from the Chinese embassy asking them not to meet with David Matus. In May 2007, the Bellinson Hospital near Israeli capital Tel Aviv organized a seminar about organ transplants. They invited David Matus to make a speech. The Chinese embassy exerted pressure on Israeli foreign minister and health ministry, demanding them to cancel the seminar or cancel the invitation to Matus. The websites of China's organ transplant centers also changed quietly. Many figures about the number of organ transplants and the waiting times were deleted or modified. Some websites disappeared completely. However, some of these original materials could still be found at their archived locations. Refined propaganda tools were also used by the Chinese Communist regime to respond to the investigations. Since June 2006, the independent investigative reports by David Matus and David Kilgore have received extensive attention in the international community. As a response, in June 2007, the Phoenix TV in Hong Kong, which is backed by the Chinese Communist regime, produced and aired a TV documentary titled An Investigation into David's Investigative Report. In this documentary, it used interviews with some officials and doctors named in the investigative report to deny the report's conclusion. The DVDs of this documentary were distributed by the Chinese Communist regime's overseas organizations. However, this documentary was full of flaws that just prove the authenticity of the investigative reports. One of the figures quoted in the Matus Kilgore report was the data from the article, The Organ Transplants Need to Set a High Threshold, published in China's official health news in 2006 from its interview with Shi Bingyi, committee member of the organ transplant branch of Chinese Medical Association. 
Shi Bing Yi stated there were over 90,000 various organ transplants in total done in China. Just last year alone, about 10,000 kidney transplants and 4,000 liver transplants were carried out. However, in the interview by the Phoenix TV, Shi Bing Yi categorically denied that he had mentioned such figures. Shi Bing Yi's original statements quoted in the David's report can still be found on the internet. Moreover, the article was reprinted by many other Chinese domestic media. Similar organ transplant statistics given by other experts from the organ transplant branch of Chinese Medical Association are also commonly available in China's government and media websites. Another kind of evidence used in the Matus and Kilgore report is the recording of the telephone conversations with large number of medical doctors in China. Among the doctors contacted, many of them admitted to have used organs from Falun Gong practitioners. Dr. Liu Guaoping from the Guangxi Ethnicities Hospital was one of the doctors who were investigated. Phoenix TV interviewed Dr. Liu Guaoping. In the interview, Dr. Liu acknowledged that he had received phone calls from the investigators and also admitted that he was asked the question in the recording, but he denied giving such reply, although the recording of his reply to the investigator was still available. The following is a comparison of what he told the investigator and what he said on Phoenix TV. Here is what Dr. Liu told the investigator on the phone. Dr. Liu also said on Phoenix TV, here is the recording of the phone conversation with the investigator. On Phoenix TV, Dr. Liu also said, was Dr. Liu asked that question by the investigator? Here is the recording of the phone conversation. I mean, it was actually interesting for me to see the video they put out or to see the response they put to NOAC because, I mean, this kind of silly uh, response, in a sense, is a vindication. Uh, it, it's a reaffirmation. I mean, if the best that they can do is contradict what's on their, I mean, deny what they put on their website or, 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 or deny what we have on tape, and, and obviously, uh, I, I think we're on to something. With more and more evidence being reported, many governments and international organizations started to express serious concern about the organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners in China. In November 2008, the United Nations Committee Against Torture 
held its 41st session in Geneva. The summary report by the committee specifically demanded the Chinese government to explain the massive increase in China's organ transplant surgeries since the start of the persecution of Falun Gong and the unexplained source of the huge organ supplies. It also demanded the Chinese government to carry out an immediate investigation into the issue, prosecute and punish all personnel involved. In fact, the revelation of this atrocity was originally from a small incident which occurred on the operating table when removing an organ from a living Falun Gong practitioner. On April 13, 2006, the female witness of the Su Jatun incident, the wife of a doctor who was involved in removing corneas from living Falun Gong practitioners, told the following true story in the form of a recording at the press conference in the U.S. National Press Club. Tai This Falun Gong practitioner whose organs were removed while unconscious would never know that this small incident which occurred at the point of her death awakened this doctor's conscience, leading to the revelation of this atrocity. However, to end this evil atrocity completely, we need an awakening of many more people's conscience. This unprecedented enormity has placed many innocent lives between life and death. Faced with this crime, each person's choice would place the conscience of humanity between life and death. <laughs>